did you never get your sea legs? Not once in five years. Whenever the sea was up, so is the contents of my stomach. What a delightful thought. We should be able to squeeze 400 a year out of the governor. Why? What's he said? He hasn't said anything, but I've seen it in his eyes, the way he pored over your letters. A very proud father. I told him you were going to publish a journal of your travels. There was a definite flicker of interest. <laughs> publish? Yes, of course. No country parsonage for you, my boy. You're under my wing now. I'll take charge of your affairs, introduce you to all my clever, witty friends, trade on your, your celebrity. Celebrity? Certainly, everyone wants to meet you. Hear stories of naked Tahitian women and giant sloves or whatever. Captain Fitzroy, this is my brother, Erasmus. Mr. Darwin. Captain. Good God. A man can collect a lot of rubbish in five years. It's a wonder you didn't sink the ship, Charles. Named, I take it, after your grandfather? Yes, and an uncle. Who drowned himself in the River Derwent. And are you a free thinker like him? I'm more of a free drinker, really. And how was the voyage for you, Captain? That's not for me to say. No? Forty views of the coast as seen from the sea, 80 plans of harbours and 82 coastal maps. All for the hydrographic department of the Admiralty. Bravo. Dinner at sea must have been a jolly affair. Yeah. From the Galapagos Islands. <laughs> Humour roasted over an open fire, rather like veal. <laughs> Armadillo roasted in its shell. A lot like duck. <laughs> Tortoise, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them weigh as much as 500 pounds. One I measured was uh, 96 inches around the waist. If one of them ever needs a suit of clothes, we must send it to Father's Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Uh, llama? Ostrich? <laughs> People wonder how it is some animals come to be extinct. Now we have the answer. Eaten by Charlie Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> You look as though you're going to the scaffold. Dignity, poise, smile. Remember, all eyes are on you. The judging has begun. Mr. President, my lords, ladies and gentlemen. No, no, no. Start with a bang. Men of Athens. What? Friends, Romans, countrymen, that sort of thing. Right. I can't do this. Yes, you can. You mustn't let the fact that every leading geologist in the land will be there put you off. Oh, God. Now, let me hear an interesting bit. There aren't any. The earthquake. Oh, stand still. And don't wave your arms around like that. Leave your tie alone. Don't squint. And speak up. The earthquake ran for 400 miles oh, along the coast, accompanied by the simultaneous eruption of a line of volcanoes. We found fresh mussel beds lying above high tide. The shellfish all dead. The land had risen eight feet. Mountains must be the product of thousands and thousands of such rises occurring again and again throughout history. Even at the very crest of the Andes, we found marine remains. The fossilized shells of creatures that once crawled about at the bottom of the sea, elevated nearly 14,000 feet above its level. Time, unimaginable tracts of time, is the key. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well Splendid. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Congratulations. Interesting paper. Oh, thank you. Where have you placed your fossil specimens? Well, I was thinking of the British Museum. Ah, you're happy to have them languish in some dusty Bloomsbury cellar? No, not at all. You'd better let me look over them for you, then. We'll let you know. 
Thank you. Tom Pazov. Who does he think he is? He thinks he's Richard Owen, the most brilliant anatomist in And Europe. you're Erasmus Darwin's little brother, Darwin of the Beagle Darwin. Lord it while you can. I don't want to lord it. Liar. What a brilliant red. Brighter than the actual plumage. I try to allow for the loss of colour that comes with death. And can you do this with my Galapagos birds? Well, I haven't finished identifying them yet, Mr. Darwin. I do know that your wren is a finch. Your gross beak is a finch. Even your blackbird is a finch. And they're unique, all new, never described before. There's even evidence that there are separate species for each Galapagos island. But, but I didn't label mine by island. You didn't label them by island. Why do you want them? Why, well, I told you. I failed to label mine by island. No, no, I, uh, I mean, why are the birds I collected suddenly of such interest to you? Well, the vice governor of the Galapagos told me he could identify which island a tortoise came from by its markings. Yes, yes, small variations are possible from island to island, adaptations to climate and so on. Yes, but the islands all have the same climate. My expert, John Gould, tells me he's found different species of finches. What if these finches were blown to the Galapagos from South America and then began to change, adapt, if you will, become more and more different from their ancestors generation after generation? First into varieties, then into new species. Each new species marooned on its own island. What are you talking about? What if the finches were blown to the Galapagos? God put those creatures there. <laughs> that makes no sense. Why would God put different birds on almost identical islands? I have no idea. It's not a question that requires an answer. Species were commanded into existence by God. They're perfect forms, and they've been perfect since the day of creation. It's divine law, God's will. I'll see to it that your expert receives my birds. Thank you. It's God you should give thanks to. Come on. Tonight, and for one night only, ladies and gentlemen, a guided tour of Charles Darwin's boneyard. Oh, for goodness sake, and yes. hurry up. Yes. This is a large, extinct, llama-like creature. And this is a giant ground sloth, discovered by Mr. Darwin at Punta Alta. Lastly. The remains of Mr. Darwin's breakfast. This skull belongs to a huge rodent. <laughs> A relative of the South American capybara. If that's the size of a rat, imagine how big the cats must have been. <laughs> I have named it Toxodon. Thank you, thank you, Professor Owen, for identifying and describing the extraordinary array of fossils discovered by Mr. Darwin on his voyage to South America. <laughs> we allow the planets and the sun to be governed by natural laws. But the smallest insect we wish to be created by a special act of God. <laughs> Surely the creation of life has to be explained in the same way as geology, using natural, ordinary, everyday causes. <laughs> well, in theory, yes, but in practice there can be no question about the prime cause. Divine will. Shouldn't men of science be free to investigate each and every means by which new species come into being? If by that you mean wild accusations about man's ancestry, the answer is no. To destroy man's unique status is to open the floodgates to anarchy. You might just as well throw muskets to the rabble. <laughs> People like Owen think that if there was no Church of England, cucumbers wouldn't grow. <clears throat> If the globe has undergone such profound changes in its history, geologically, surely all living creatures must have changed with it to adapt to their new conditions. 
Well, otherwise they would have perished. Uh, some did perish, it seems. <laughs> yes, but the continued existence of life on Earth can only be explained by the assumption that a creature like this was replaced by the modern-day armadillo. There must be a law which causes new species to appear in place of the extinct ones. Ah, that, my boy, is the mystery of mysteries. The person who can solve that riddle will take all of the scientific prizes. It's the variety of their beaks that's so amazing. They graduate perfectly in size from this large parrot-like beak, similar to a hawfinch, perfectly designed for cracking nuts, to this tiny warbler finch, fine as a chaffinch, to feed on insects. And they're all descended from this one. The common ground finch. I've started to prepare some colour plates. So put my words to shame. Raz! Raz? Oh. Raz! Wake up! Mm. What time is it? Lunch time. Oh. Well, then go away and come back at tea time. The Galapagos Islands are almost identical. The same geology, the same climate. I'm glad to hear it now. Go away. So why should different finches inhabit identical islands? Raz? Oh. Oh. Small changes over ages and ages can throw up mountain ranges and sink continents. If mountains can move and rivers can move, then why can't animals? Finches, tortoises, iguanas. If you trace animals across the surface of the Earth or dig down and trace them back through time, you come face to face with the same truth. Which is? New beings can appear on the Earth. Perhaps everything is part of one ancestral chain. Man? Mouse? Armadillo. No. It's nonsense to think of animals or man as climbing some ladder. To talk of one animal being higher than another. No. No. I think it's more like a tree. Tree of life. Each new species springs from the parent tree like a shoot. These shoots branch and divide in their turn, and so on and so on. Some branches die out, others keep developing. The trunk, the ancient common ancestor, the stock stock from which all animals and plants sprang. Nursed by warm sunbeams in primeval caves, organic life began beneath the waves. Hence, without parent, by spontaneous birth, rise the first steps of animated Earth. Grandfather Zoonomia. Would it be too bold to imagine that all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament? It's in our blood, Charles. And grandfather was vilified for it. It's in our blood. What Charles Darwin glimpsed over 150 years ago is now the bedrock of biology.